love serving in the coffee ministry at Sherwood Oaks because it gives me a chance to meet new people and see them first thing in the morning and be able to give them a friendly hello. Everybody just really is appreciative of the coffee and the tea and the hot chocolate that Sherwood Oaks serves. I've gotten to meet people that I normally would never meet that come in between services while I'm refilling and they just need a friend. I've gotten to mentor someone that I never would have met as she came in very nervously and was just looking for some friendship. And so God has really blessed people being in this space when newcomers come in. We really need a lot of people to make sure that coffee stays full. And then also we just need a lot of friendly faces to greet people and I think they feel more comfortable when they have their coffee. Yeah, hey, can we give a hand to people like April and all of those that serve and make sure that, uh, that we've got coffee? We, we walked in this morning, and our, our worship and production team shows up here about 6.30 on, on Sunday mornings to turn everything on, make sure everything's set, ready to go. And, and when they got here, they, they turned on the, the video switcher that puts all the stuff up on the screen, and it was like, no, I'm not going to turn on. And like, no, seriously, turn on. We need you. And it was like, no, I'm just going to take the day off. And, and so during the 8 o'clock service, we didn't have any screens. Uh, it just barely popped up at the beginning of the 930 service. And, and I thought, you know, two things. Number one, um, the Lord has worked for millennia without technology. Certainly he can do it for today. And so it's not a big deal. And then number two, like we still got coffee. Our coffee machines work. And so we're going to be able to make it through together. Uh, well, welcome. I mean, we are so glad that, that you are here, and I love our church, and I love this Sunday, College Sunday, as we get to welcome college students um, here for the first time or back uh, from their summer break. And back in the, the spring, uh, before you know, college came to an end or, or school or whatever, we got into summer, uh, a buddy of mine named Andrew Clampett reached out to, to me and he said, hey, I'm getting ready to do a, a Tough mutter uh, later on this summer. Would you be interested in doing that with me? Um, he evidently thought that I was dumb enough to say yes. And I was. Uh, so I, sure, man, I'm, I'm in. I'd always wanted to do one. And if you're not familiar with the Tough Mudder, uh, it's this six-mile run uh, around this course that is filled with about 20 different obstacles. Um, everything from like mud pits that you have to crawl through to obstacles that you have to climb up and, and over. Uh, it was, it's kind of this adventure race, and, and so I was in. Uh, and one of the things that Tough Mudder is known for is the very last obstacle called electroshock therapy. And this is a, a picture of it on the, on the screen. I think it's coming. Yeah, there we go. Electroshock therapy. And so you have to run through this last little obstacle. And those little black things hanging down there um, are wires pulsating with 10,000 volts of electricity. And so as you run through this obstacle, you don't know when and you don't know how many times, you just know you're going to at some point get hit with a jolt of electricity that's going to pulse through your body. And, and like I typically, when I sign up for an event, I train for it, but how do you train for something like this? Like you take a knife and shove it into an electrical outlet. Okay, I'm ready to go. Like you don't train and prepare your body for something like this. And so we, we go through the course and, and what's even worse is that they just tempt you because they put the finish line literally 10 feet on the other side of that obstacle. It's right there. And so we go through the course, we're doing pretty well. We're muddy, we're cut up, we're, we're bleeding, it's awesome. But we're making it through all the obstacles. And we get to this one. And I watched my, my friend Andrew who invited me uh, and, and he looked at me and I'm like, um, go on, you're the one that, uh, that this was his idea. And he's like, all right. And so he starts running and I mean almost immediately, you could hear it and he just drops into the water because water and electricity also go really well together. And so I'm watching going, that looked painful and I see the next guy go and exact same thing happens to him. And at that moment, I'm questioning every decision in my life that led to that point. I'm like, what in the world am I doing? But two things happened. I look over and, and just right on the other side of that obstacle, they have set up bleachers, almost like a grandstand of people for some reason right there. <laughs> and it's filled with people encouraging us to go, you can do it, you can do it. And, 
And that was encouraging for a moment, but then I thought, are you, are you cheering me on or are you just waiting to see the carnage that follows? <laughs> but then there was a second group of people and it was the ones that had already made it through the end. They went through it, they crossed the finish line, they got their little finisher's headband and they were coming back cheering those of us on who still needed to finish. And I looked at some of them and I thought, you know, if they can do it, then certainly I can too. And so I put my head down and I started running and same thing, got hit with a jolt of electricity. My legs gave out from underneath me. I dropped like a sack of potatoes. And it was uh, not, <laughs> are you for real? Where? <laughs> I did not send that picture in. That is not officially approved. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> Just got to take a moment to compel myself. <laughs> yes, yes. Nice. So, so I get down across the fish. I get my head fan. And, and I go home and my wife is, oh, now that, that's, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that picture. I, I told someone, there is an epic picture will never, more epic picture will never be taken of me in that moment. Um, anyway, I go home and, and my wife asked me, how, how was it? And I said, that was the dumbest thing that I've ever done in my life. And it was awesome. Like, I loved it. I couldn't wait to do it again. So that event is not for the faint of heart. In fact, they literally have warning signs all over the place that if you faint or have a weak heart, you should not be doing this event. And yet over the course of the weekend, because it was a Saturday and Sunday thing, over the course of the weekend, literally thousands of people went through it. Thousands of people started at the start line, made it through all of the courses, and, and, and came out on the other side and received their headband. And they came out, and they were beaten, and they were bruised, but they made it. Maybe even some of you. Because you, you faced the fear, you, you set it over to the side, and you ran through the challenges that were ahead of you. And I think in a way that, that walking by faith is kind of like that. Walking by faith is it, it, kind of like that. It can be hard. It can be um, a struggle. It can sometimes hurt. But, but, we, but we move through it, trusting that the Lord is going to guide us along the way. The author of Hebrews says that faith is being confident in what you hope for and assured of what you do not see. And that kind of faith can be hard. Walking by faith can lead us to some challenging places. Walking by faith uh, can, can lead us down this, this trail where we come to the end of ourselves. We come to the end of our resources, our courage, our strength. Like we can't muster those things up enough in our life. And we have to learn how to lean and be dependent and, and surrender to the Lord in those times. That's why I say that putting your faith in action is not for the faint of heart. It's not. Putting your faith into action takes courage and commitment. It takes strength and endurance. And, and I, think, I think the reason why so many of us, and myself included, why we settle for a comfortable, safe, maybe even sometimes ineffective faith is because we know the pain that it can cause. We know the uncertainty that, that the Lord maybe leads us to, to help us grow and trust in him more. We, we inherently know that putting our faith into action is not for the faint of heart. And, and I think oftentimes the faith that I settle for, maybe, maybe you do too, is just a faith that that is predictable and, and safe. But what we see in scripture is a faith that is anything but predictable and safe. In fact, we've been spending the last 11 weeks through the summer looking at men and women who put their faith into action and it took them to places that they did not expect to do things that they did not feel called or prepared to do, but they leaned into their faith in God and trusted him. And I think what the author does here as we, as we kind of round the corner and, and, and wrap up this series is, is he turns this attention from their faith to our faith. And he says, if we're going to live with that kind of faith, man, it's going to take some, some courage. It's going to take some endurance. But we don't have to do it alone. 
If you have a Bible or a Bible app that you like to use, uh, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, if you are new with us to Sherwood Oaks, um, every week, I mean, one of my core convictions is that we want to allow God's word to guide us, um, not stories, not illustrations, not science experiments, not jokes. Um, we want the word of God. And so we are going to dive into it. This is our foundation that we stand on, that we build our church on. And, and so we love it. When you bring uh, your Bible with you so that we can get into the word together, uh, we'll also have the words up on the screen if you, if you want to follow along. But all summer long, we have been looking at these courageous men and women in Hebrews 11 who cast their fears aside and put their faith into action. They stepped out and they took risks. They walked with a sense of comfort and, and trust and confidence in the Lord. And we have looked at the faith of everyone from a prostitute to the patriarchs and how they walked with this sense of confidence and assurance in the Lord. And as we head into the finish line of this series, I wanna, I wanna take this turn from looking at their faith to now looking at our own faith. From how they put their faith into action into how we can put our faith into action. And that's the transition that the author makes as he moves from chapter 11 to chapter 12. <clears throat> Look at it with me. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse one. He writes, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I love this text. The author has just spent the entire last chapter talking about uh, the faith of all of these people, uh, people who were broken and flawed just like we are, and yet walked with this incredible sense of trust in the Lord. He spent the last chapter looking back on them, and now he turns his attention to his own faith community, to his own church, and he says, in, in light of their faith, like, let's look to them as our encouragement and our example of putting our own faith into action, just like they did. And he uses this analogy of a runner in a race. And back in, in, in that time, um, athletes would, would train by um, weighing themselves down with all sorts of things. So from, from clothes to, to weight, they would, they would just put all of this on them uh, to kind of grow in strength and endurance. <clears throat> but then on race day, they would strip all of that off. Like the Greek custom um, was to run as naked as a toddler who just got out of the bathtub. And praise God, we don't have that tradition anymore. <laughs> But he points to that as an example of how we are to run this race of faith, of how we are to run after Jesus. He taps into that and he, and he knows that running this race of faith, it is hard enough without carrying this extra load of, of baggage and burden and doubts and fears and sin, without carrying the weight of all of these things that Jesus has set us free from. And so he tells us to throw those off and to run this race has been marked out for us. Throw off those things that can trip us up. Throw off those things so that we can run with perseverance through these challenges. And through it all, the author implores us to fix our eyes on Jesus. To not just to, to try to do better, not just be stronger. No, he says, fix your eyes on on Jesus. Jesus was our perfect example of how to walk faithfully, how to walk with endurance. Our motivation comes by looking at Jesus and the example he set for us. Jesus looked beyond the physical and the emotional strain of the cross. 
to, to the joy of fulfilling God's plan for redemption. Jesus looked beyond the cross to the joy of paying the price so that you could be adopted into God's family. And so the author says, fix your eyes on him. His endurance is a model for how we overcome challenges that we face in this life and in our faith. Coming from a family of uh, farmers, one of the things that um, I love, I just, I love working outdoors. I love working my my hands, getting, getting dirty, um, kind of tending the the, the ground that that God has, has entrusted to, to me for this time. And, and I've always loved mowing. I mean, it's one of my favorite things to, to do. Um, even to the point, and I've confessed in here before, <clears throat> that when I was in fourth grade, um, we had to write a poem. And I wrote a poem about how much I love mowing. Uh, that's a, <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> I didn't get out much as a fourth grader. <laughs> But one of my, one of my favorite things uh, about mowing is that when I'm done, when I've kind of cleaned everything up and, and put everything away, and I'm walking back into the house, I love to just kind of look over the, the work that I just finished. And, and my favorite thing is when I can just look down the lines and I see these nice, straight, you know, solid, even lines in, in the yard. There's just something that's so satisfying uh, about that. And again, coming from a family of of farmers, I remember my dad teaching me uh, how to get those straight lines. And he he said, what you do is you just have to look forward and and pick out a spot. Just fix your eyes on something and just start walking to it. And you'll get that straight line. He said, if you look down at where your wheel is, you're going to start to kind of wobble. If you look back to, to, to check out everything that you've already done, you're going to go off course. If you look around at everything that you still have to do, you're, you're going to start to veer. He said, just fix your eyes on that point and go towards it until you get there. And then turn around and then fix your eyes on another point and go to it until you get there. And I think that the same is true for our faith. If we walk in faith with our head down, discouraged, in despair, if we walk in faith constantly looking back at where we've been or or what we've done or what's been done to us, we're we're never going to be able to overcome those things and and move forward. If if we're constantly looking around at the troubles and the problems and, and the worries, we're gonna be consumed by those and we're gonna start moving off course. And so we fix our eyes on Jesus, the true north of our faith, and we walk towards him, trusting that he is going to lead and guide our steps. And that's true in our lives, but it's also true for the church. It can be tempted, tempting to walk sometimes with our head down, even in the church. We walk with our head down, discouraged about where we are, discouraged maybe about things going on. We can, we can walk in faith looking back at what was, looking back at what we might label the glory days and long for those. We can look around us at our culture and become a little dismayed at the direction that it's heading and kind of fear and fret. But I think that just as Jesus calls us individually to fix our eyes on him, he tells us to do that as a church. To to focus on him, to trust in the direction that he is leading us. To not get caught up in looking down or looking back or looking around, but to fulfill what he has called us to do here in this moment And I want to make sure that we don't miss out on on this important part of the the text. Because it's true that putting your faith in action is not for the faint of heart. But but the good news is, is that you do not have to do it alone. In fact, you were never meant to walk in faith alone. Faith is personal, sure, but it's not private. We, We were meant to live our faith out in community. It's why God has given us the church And the author of Hebrews addresses his faith community in chapter 12. And and I think what we can take away from that is that putting your faith into action happens best in a faith community. 
Like we need one another to encourage us, to challenge us, to confront us sometimes when we are living in sin. I have people in my life, both here in this church and and friends who are in ministry across the U.S. who have full permission to speak truth into my life, even in those times and those places I don't want to hear it. To speak truth into my life and call me on my junk when I need it to be called on. And I have the same permission to do that for them. We need one another. We need to be a part of a church family that loves us as we are, but then helps us to grow and and be formed and shaped and molded more and more into the image of Christ. We need a church family to help us throw off anything and everything that entangles us or wants to trip us up, that helps us fix our eyes on Jesus and become more like him. And that's why putting your faith into action, it happens best in community. It happens best when you are part of the family of God in his church. And as we close out, I want to just share a few really quick things about how I think this text um, shares the importance of why we need to be a part of the body of Christ in this church. And these things are important, whether you have been a part of the, a, a church for decades, or maybe this is your very first time here. College students, this is, this is why we feel so strongly and desire to be your faith community because we all need this in our life. And the first thing is this, uh, being a part of a church family encourages our spiritual growth. The church is a place where we can grow together. We can sharpen one another. A church family helps us let go of distractions uh, and, and walk away from sin so that we can walk towards a deeper level of faith in Jesus. And second, the church is a place where we can endure together. The, the call to endurance that scripture gives us is hard enough, and we, we can never do it alone. We have to do it with others. The church is meant to be a community that bears each other's burdens, that, that, that when I'm burdened, you carry it with me. When you're burdened, I carry it with you. And in that, we lighten each other's load. We encourage one another. We give each other strength to face challenges. Our mission as a church is people helping people grow generations of Christ-led influencers. People helping people. That first part is so important because it means us coming together with one another to follow Jesus. Third, being part of a church helps us focus on Christ Again, fixing our eyes on Jesus is vital and and, and we do it in here when, when we gather for worship. We, we do it when we get together in connect groups and in homes for, for dinner. As a church, we want to continually direct our attention and our affection to Jesus. Fourth, being a part of a church helps us persevere in purpose. That Jesus endured the cross for a greater purpose. And as a church, we have been called to look beyond ourselves and to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our world and in our community serving them the way that Jesus served us, loving them the way that Jesus loved us. And so our vision at Sherwood Oaks is unleashing the church with the love of Jesus to make an eternal difference in the lives of at-risk people. We want to unleash the church beyond the walls of this building to go into our community, into our world, to make a meaningful difference in the lives of others, in the name of Jesus. Serve like Jesus served, love like Jesus loves. And we are not interested in being the best church in Bloomington. We are interested in being the best church for Bloomington. When people ask me what what my vision is for Sherwood Oaks, I think a perfect picture of it is the event that we did this last week, the furniture giveaway. It's the church body coming together, sharing its resources, serving those in in need. As we were leaving one evening from, from serving, I think it was Tuesday night, my girls were in the car with me and we were talking about everything that they experienced. And I told them, you know, girls, if, if Jesus were walking in Bloomington today, I think he would have been at the furniture giveaway tonight. Like that's exactly where Jesus would have been. 
We were able to come alongside of over 500 international students and not only provide them with some furniture, but to show them the love of Jesus in a tangible way and hopefully to plant some gospel seeds in their heart that, that through follow-up and through different events, that, that those seeds will begin to take root and grow gospel fruit in their life. And the reason I love that event so much is because it takes the entire church to be unleashed to make it happen. In fact, if you served in any way, if you volunteered, if you led, if you um, moved furniture, if you donated furniture, would you just stand so that we can just see the scope of everything that it took and to show our appreciation for you? Yeah, awesome. Love it. And it's family serving together, it's individuals coming alongside of one another to make a difference in the lives of others. And that's one way we live out our vision. Another way is by partnering with organizations in our community that are doing good work. Instead of duplicating their efforts and, and trying to you know, do our own Sherwood Oaks thing over here, we wanna come alongside of people in our community that are doing good stuff and just say like, how can we come alongside and, and, and be a part of what you're doing, encourage what you're doing, support what you're doing? Uh, and, and so we work through all of these community partnerships with organizations that are faith-based and even some that aren't. Uh, but one of our community partners is the Salvation Army. And let's, uh, let's check out this video. I just wanted to do the things that Jesus did. And the more I read scripture, the more I saw that Jesus really cared about poor and marginalized people. The Salvation Army not only practices practical works of justice through immediate needs and all the social services that we do, but we also preach it. Like it's a, it's a large part of our teachings and our doctrine. And so you hear this invitation to be a world changer, to participate in actively alleviating the suffering within our community because Jesus invites us to do it and to partner with him in the work that he's already doing to do it. And we actually see lives changed. My personal mission statement is to authentically love the broken, and every day within the Salvation Army, there's an opportunity to do so. To authentically love the broken, that's evident in Jesus' life throughout Scripture, over and over again, when Jesus is meeting with the marginalized, meeting with the poor, meeting with the widow, meeting with the adulterer, uh, where he is loving despite circumstances, despite the sin in people's lives, and authentically loving them. The Salvation Army has been serving in Monroe County since 1907. Uh, so we've got a long history of meeting human needs in Jesus' name without discrimination. If we can get to the root of why people continue to come back to us year after year, week after week, then we can begin to move the needle when it comes to the poverty within our community. Community partners like Sherwin Oaks are very, very important and crucial to our ministry. For the 2023 Monroe County Backpack Blitz, we were able to distribute 600 backpacks along with hundreds and hundreds of school supplies for local students, kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. And that is only made possible because of the volunteer involvement and the financial support of Sherwood Oaks. And then staff from Sherwood Oaks this year came and helped pack backpacks, which has just been outstanding. Sherwood Oaks every year is a great partner in support of our Angel Tree program by adopting hundreds of local children, shopping for their wish lists, and providing those gifts for those children. And then the final piece is the Red Cattle Campaign. With our only major fundraising happening at the Christmas season, Sherwood Oaks took the That's second yep. to last Saturday in December. The major and big one. The big the one. Yeah, the big yeah. Saturday. Raised $10,000, <laughs> yes. right? Yes, record Year. Record breaking year. So Sherwood Oaks is a huge asset to us at the Salvation Army and we couldn't be more grateful to, to partner with you in the ways that we do. Mm, I love that video. I love that we have partners like that doing good stuff. All right, I'll wrap up with, with this. Being a part of the church family helps us overcome weariness because putting our faith into action can sometimes be exhausting. It can be hard. We, we can sometimes... 
um, feel the, the weight of, of swimming upstream in a culture that is so often and so quickly running downstream. And, and, and the church is a place where we can gather and we can encourage one another, we can bolster up one another in our faith and be made strong. And I cannot tell you how many times I have walked in here on a Sunday morning. If I can just be honest, this was one of the last places I wanted to be. Or I just wanted to hide in my office and stay there because of the week that was in ministry or in life and I didn't feel like I would have anything to give anyone. And then I come into this place and I worship with you all. And I see your faith expressing itself in love. I, I have conversations with you out in the lobby and, and you share what's going on in your life and, and, and I carry that burden with you and you allow me to share what's going on in mine and you carry that burden with me and I feel a little bit lighter Oftentimes people may have no idea what is going on up in here and they'll just come up and they'll give me a hug and in that moment, your arms are the arms of Jesus wrapping around me. It's a physical extension of his love to me. That's why the church matters. That's why we need one another. I have the blessing of a unique perspective from this place and I get to see you as you lean in as we study the word of God together and I just kind of look past those of you who are asleep but I look at those of you that are like, we're in it together and you're with me. (laughs) You give me the strength to my faith, encourage me to fix my eyes on Jesus and remind me that we are in this together and I hope that I do the same for you and I hope that we can do the same for each other. And so church, following Jesus is not for the faint of heart, but we can do it with one another. God has given us the church to help us and to help others walk with him. And so may we be a place of people helping people throw off everything that entangles or ensnares or is trying to trip us up. May we run this race with perseverance together, helping each other fix our eyes on Jesus. And may we not grow weary or lose heart as we strive to follow Jesus and help others do the same, as we strive to put our faith into action. Jesus, thank you for your church. Thank you that it is messy and it is imperfect, filled and led by flawed people beautifully broken, Lord, but you have chosen this as a way for us to come alongside of one another, encourage our faith, put our focus on you. And so, Lord, may this be a place where we do that. And Father, may you grow us in our faith with one another so that we can help the world know Jesus. In his name, amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, there's a playlist with more like it. Please be sure to give it a thumbs up and click subscribe to see more videos from Sherwood Oaks. Also, if you have a friend or family member who may find this video useful, please click the share button below. Thanks and have a great day.